Hello and welcome to Concert Pipeline. I'm Steve Jones. Today on the program we have Jack Star of Jack Star's Burning Star. Yes, that's a lot of times I've said star uh, in the past 15 seconds. Uh, but I had a great chat with uh, Jack Star uh, about his project, about his new album that's coming out uh, July 15th called Souls of the Innocent, uh, and so much more. We had a really, really great conversation, uh, and we're going to get to that in just a little bit. Before we do, uh, I will update you on what is going on in my world. Uh, it was a busy weekend. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, just a lot went on. I, I, I tend to pack things in, and uh, I don't sit still very well, and that's a problem. But um, I'd say overall I had a good weekend. I uh, started with, uh, on Saturday I had the kids and we hung out for a while. So, okay, so there was a little bit of, um, of downtime there. Um, and then Saturday night, um, uh, my son had found a an, an ad in a Vacaville kind of manual about uh about it's called a dive in movies and I'd never heard of a dive in movie nor been to one I was like oh you when he told me I was like you mean drive in right uh and he's like no dive in and so I look at this ad and it has uh three different Disney movies that are playing at a pool in town and uh, and I'm like uh over the course of the the summer and I'm like oh okay cool uh so that sounds like something the kids would want to do and they were both about it and it's hard to get them both to agree on uh, on anything, let alone um, an activity to do. So uh, it was pretty much a you know conclusion that it was going to happen. Um, and it was my kids' mom's night uh, with the kids, so uh, I kept the kids for the day. And then we uh, met up at the, the pool. She brought her other kids, and uh, and it, and as well as my daughter's two friends came over. So there was kids all over the place uh, for this dive-in movie to watch Finding Nemo at the community pool. All right. Well, what uh, you know that sounds like a load of fun, right? Well, there were about 200 people there probably. And I figured uh, every one of them would be in the water in this pool, which was not uh, fit for 200 people. But a lot of them sat out uh, of the pool and just uh, hung out and while uh, a bunch of kids and folks played in the pool. So um, I will tell you, it wasn't very well put together uh, in that the, the, the movie uh, didn't play very well. This, it was not tested or whatever what the problem was, but it would be dark for several minutes and then uh, and then it'd get brighter, 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 and then go dark. And I, and I had a fun time. Uh, I got in the pool with my son while my daughter went off and played with her friends. And, uh, and we just hung out and didn't look at it as a, a movie thing because there was not really a movie playing. There was one speaker in front of the screen also uh, when there's 200 people yelling and screaming all around. And you're not going to hear shit, right? So uh, we, uh, dis we, we hung out for a bit. I had to make a departure uh, well before the movie was slated to be over because I was like, you know, I got to come home, got to sleep. I was getting up at like 3.15 in the morning the next day to go out fishing, uh, which I did. I went with my buddy, John. We went uh, fishing up at uh, Fort Ross on the coast and uh, it was great weather. I mean, the water was super calm. We got, uh, got kayaks out. And, uh, and we set up crab pots too, which was a, a, a lot of fun. Um, and I, mean, I love crabbing. I mean, it's just, it's exciting. They, yeah, it's not a very difficult, uh, you know, activity, but you, but there's a lot of, it's like gambling a little bit, right? It's like the excitement of you pull up the rope uh, after a couple of hours, uh, you pull, 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 pull until you, uh, until you get the pot up and you see what's in, uh, in that pot. And, and hopefully there are a couple of crabs that you can keep. And, uh, and so, yes, we did get a couple of crabs uh, from our crab pots. Uh, we, um, again, that was great. But we were out there uh, fishing for um, rockfish. And, uh, and so we spent, you know, hours fishing. And, uh, and I'm not the best fisherman. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. But, um, but I get out and I try. And there's a lot I still need to learn and practice. And, you know, it's not tying. and, uh, and getting comfortable with the sport and when to use what lure and uh and all of that right i try I, i'm not a super fisherman but i enjoy it right so my buddy john was very patient with me though as i would snag uh my lure and then lose my weights and everything and and that's 
uh, tiring for me because then it leads to a 10 minute process of me fumbling with the rod and trying to uh, get out enough line to tie a new jig on there or what have you and, uh, and get all set. But I'll tell you, I was proud of how I did. I walked away uh, with four rockfish. Um, I, I had a good day. And one, one pole, I actually got two rockfish on, uh, on one pole. So that was, uh, that was enjoyable. And, uh, and it was a good day out, but it's long day. It's a long fucking day and it's exhausting. And then you, it's not even just a two and a half hour drive back uh, that, uh, that you have to live through. Uh, once you get back, there's two hours of breaking stuff down, taking it out, uh, unloading the kayaks, washing the kayaks and everything, all of your gear, uh, and uh, and cleaning the fish and all of that. And uh, you just want to be home on the couch with a beer, chilling and like passing out, watching something on TV, right? Uh, yeah, it took a long time for me to get to that that point. But uh but again, a rewarding day. I, I don't think it's something I could do, uh, you know, every couple of weeks or anything, or as frequently as I uh, duck hunt. Uh, but but I had a good time. Uh, that is my weekend in a nutshell. So that's good. Uh, that's good. Um, I will tell you, there's a lot of music news coming up at the end of the program. Uh, lots going on. So uh, we will get into that a little bit later. But let's not delay any more. Let's bring in Jack Star of Jack Star's Burning Star. Here it is. My interview with Jack. Spot. So, Jack, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about you? Not too shabby. You know, you're uh, you're out on the East Coast right now, right? Yes, uh, we're on the East Coast of Florida. It's uh, kind of Central Florida. It's called Melbourne. Okay. But okay. not how the long... one in Australia. The one in Florida. No. <laughs> the closer one, right? So, you uh, got it. centrally located. Uh, how long have you been there? Oh, about. Almost, uh, almost 20 years now, about, you know, 16, 17 years. Nice, nice. And, uh, and so you get to play a lot of shows in the, uh, in the area? Yeah, we do. And uh, we also uh, go out to Europe uh, and we do uh, shows over there. And uh, which is for us has always been more of a, uh, of a metal market for, you know, for the kind of metal that we do and so on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, uh, tell me, tell me about your first tour that you did of Europe. I'm sure it was many, many eons ago. Uh, well, we really kind of came back into the limelight around uh, 2006, and uh, we realized that we had a nice following in Germany, so we went to Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, our records were getting released on European labels. Uh, in Germany, in Italy, and in Greece. Uh, we went to Greece several times as well. And uh, we discovered that there's a whole bunch of metalheads in Europe, just like in yeah. America, but they seem to be more into uh, old school metal, which yeah. I don't want to pigeonhole myself, but you know, it's a little bit kind of what we do. Uh, it's kind of more reminiscent of some of the uh, 80s metal. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to talk about that, but I want to go back even a little bit farther. So what, sure. what did you li listen to as a kid? What were your, your parents, uh, uh, what did they, they have in the house? And like, were they musical influences at all? My parents really were not musical. It would have been great if they had been. Uh, my mother, though, did attempt uh, at playing... Uh, violin and piano but um she just wasn't good at it <laughs> yeah so, so like she was no help but i love my mom and she's still alive which is great my dad had did not have one musical bone in his body and uh i really didn't grow up around music nope so where did that start for you then Kind of started with the uh, British invasion, you know, uh, all these bands coming out of England. And I'm not necessarily, you know, talking about the early bands like the Beatles and the Stones, because I was never really a fan of either one. Uh, I'm talking about around 70 when uh, Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and all these kind of uh, bands came out and... Uh, and I was very intrigued by a guitar player, guitar playing, you know, and I wanted to 
emulate that. And then, um, then Johnny Winter came out, Jeff Beck came out, Clapton with Cream, um, Brian May with Queen. Yeah. Uh, so all these great guitar players came out in the early 70s. Yeah. And did you see them live? Were you going to the, the live shows and you're like, that's, that's really cool to me? I did. Uh, I saw I saw Black Sabbath when I was a teenager, too young to actually get into where they were playing. It was their first American tour. I think I was 16. They got in, uh, you know, they came out with these big crosses and they were all dressed in black. They had this eerie kind of uh, almost satanic kind of music. And uh, it was actually kind of scary, you know. I wasn't, yeah. uh, I wasn't really prepared for that, but I yeah. liked it. I just didn't like the craziness. Uh, I mean, there were people being uh, hauled away in stretchers at the show, you know, because wow. it was really a turning point. Um, just like uh, Altamont was a turning point. It was kind of like the end of a hippie culture, you know, kind of, and it was this uh, kind of uh, more stark, more realistic, more grimy, and but the music had a much harder edge. Sure, sure. And and so did you, did you kind of get, uh, grow this taste with friends in high school? Like, were there other people and you guys started playing and emulating them? Actually, not really. This is the weird thing. Um, in my high school, there was maybe only three or four kids that even had long hair. So the whole myth about, you know, long haired hippies, pot smoking, as portrayed in all those movies like uh, Dazed and Confused and, uh, you know, all these movies really made it out like it was like um, nonstop you know, party, like Fast Time at Ridgemont's High, but it was not. It was basically uh, the kids were very much into dressing preppy and being conformist, and, and the girls were gravitating um, towards guys that were like athletes, you know, clean-cut athletes, which I was not because I sucked at sports. Yeah. And I... <laughs> It wasn't big enough to play football. I'm only like five foot six. So, uh, but it did start changing a little bit towards my last year in high school. I was kind of noticed. In fact, one day there was this, uh, I don't know, I'm kind of digressing. Stop me yeah. if I get too long winded, okay? No, you're good. This is a long conversation. We got time. So go All for right. it. Anyway, so one day I'm, um, in high school, uh, senior year. And I see this girl who was like this really pretty cheerleader who never even noticed me. And she was always into, you know, these preppy guys, you know, and and, um, and I see she had a little button on her outfit and the button said Black Sabbath. I really did a double take. I'm going, okay, what is going on? I went right up to her and I was not really diplomatic, but I had to say it. I went up to her and her name was Carol. I said, I said, you know, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I always thought you were into like this really lame kind of, you know, Neil Diamond or whatever the heck they were listening to, Carpenters. And here I see you with a Black Sabbath button on your cheerleading outfit. So I go, you do know that I play in a band and I've seen them and maybe we should talk about them one day. Like at my house when my parents aren't home. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't really go that far, but. No. <laughs> but that's probably what I was thinking at the time. Right, right, yeah. Just kind of started that connection for you a little bit. Uh, and and so tell me about picking up your first guitar. Like, did, was it natural for you? Who gave it to you? Well, actually, um, my mother, um, I think my mother took pity on me because uh, 
I had this really horrible guitar. It was unplayable. It was yeah. like, it was called that Tiesco. Mm, T-E-I-S-C-O. And uh, if you delve into like interviews of various guitar players, some of them may actually mention this one because it was just so horrible that it stuck in your mind. So anyway, you know, as something that was an obstacle that, you know, so anyway, I think my mom took pity on me and uh, I took her to this uh, store called Sam Ash Music and um, she got me a really nice guitar and uh, I became friends with the owner's son. And uh, we, we actually started a band for a while too. In fact, he's now the CEO of Sam Ash, but it's kind, oh, of, yeah. it's kind of funny how life, you know, works, you know in mysterious yeah. ways, you know, and, uh, and uh, we were just like, we, we, we kind of bonded because like I said, there really weren't many people embracing that uh, music, lifestyle, you know, the, the, that look. So, and we kind of would recognize each other. You know? Oh, there's a Kendrick spirit. Oh, wow. Oh, look at him. He's got long hair. Oh wait, look at this. He's wearing like a, a velvet jacket like uh the Stones might have worn or the Kinks or you know, this is cool, you know. Cause I was already dressing like that my last year of high school. Yeah. You know, I was really uh I don't know, I just I just want it to be like that. And yeah. I didn't want it, I didn't want to um to be told that i can't be like that because i live on long island in a town called long beach where half the kids were surfers and uh, the other half were preppy sports people and i said you know it's screw it and then to continue this kind of non-conformity uh when i got my first car it was actually this really strange looking French car called a Citroën. And uh, I just, I really liked it. I wasn't trying to be different, but there was a dentist in my little town that was selling it. Uh -huh. it was what I could afford. I painted a big star on it on the door because my last name was Star, is Star, my real it last is. name. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and that was that, you know, and uh, I just, stayed on that path and here i am a hundred years later well you were you were 30 when uh, virgin steel uh, when you created virgin steel so it was sometime after uh, high school obviously right so tell me tell me kind of how that came about um and how you formed virgin steel uh again uh i was like really into um the whole british thing again yeah i was reading about in new musical express any me which i always thought was a funny name for a newspaper because it sounds like enemy enemy yeah but it's enemy and i was reading about some band called iron maiden and i was very you know intrigued you know wow they, they sound cool you know sounds like they're doing something a little bit different and um and i was you know reading about saxon and uh they kind of all came out around that same time budgie and uh so and and i really uh like that kind of music you know and i didn't want to play american sounding music uh i didn't even want to play american sounding metal and i and i didn't have an affinity towards it maybe it's because i was born in europe and growing up um I didn't really hear a lot of American music. Uh, French radio e either plays French music or they play classical music. So I was listening a lot to classical music. And, uh, and that, you know, I listened a little bit to American music, um, which I liked, but it didn't like really excite me. Yeah, yeah. 
And so, uh, and so kind of you perform this band and you kind of, you're at the entrance of power metal, uh, yes. you know, right at that same time. And so how do you kind of define your sound then with it, you know, when there isn't really this uh, confining genre of, of sorts that, uh, that what you want to do fits into? Well, what it was too was um, I wanted to combine all these influences that I grew up with, uh, which was classical blues, because um, I listened to a lot of B.B. King, Freddie King, Albert King, anybody named King. I was and Albert Kings, yeah. It didn't matter. No, no, no Elvis, but you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, so I, you know, I, inf I incorporated those influences, including um, Middle Eastern music. Now, the reason that happened is basically, um, my mom was born in Turkey, mm. and uh, so she she sometimes around the house would actually play weird, like no, it wasn't weird to us, but but it was you know Turkish music, which had a lot of these um, these scales that aren't used in Western music, and uh, I really like them a lot, and um, you know so I wanted to like incorporate that and classical music. And um, and that's what I did with uh, Virgin Steel. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and so tell me kind of about that experience. Virgin Steel was around for about three years or so, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. uh, so tell me about the dynamic of that band and what you learned from that band that took you to the next stage in your career. Okay, well, that's a great question. Uh, I, did, I did really, um, have a good interaction, interaction with the singer who was the other songwriter in the band besides myself. I was the main songwriter when I was in the band, uh, but he brought a lot of interesting ideas to the table. Uh, he was more of a trained musician than I was. So he knew the rules that I was gleefully breaking. Mm. And uh, so there was always a little bit of, um, what's the word? A little bit of a conflict. It was a little contentious uh, because I really didn't want to be told, you know, this doesn't work or that doesn't work or you can't use, you know, the pentatonic scale when I'm doing a minor harmonic minor, uh, you know, driven song and blah, blah, blah. and. Um, and then I would revert back to a quote from Duke Ellington, which I loved. He said, the only rule in music should be that it should sound good. And that was what I felt. So, and I would tell him, I would say, listen, I appreciate that you know more musical theory than I do. But I have to disagree because I think this sounds good. So yeah. that was a little bit of butting heads, which probably was one of the factors that led to our uh, breakup. Yeah. And so did you kind of look back on that, you know, and kind of say, OK, this is something, you know, this, this didn't work out with that, you know, with Virgin Steel. but. You know, I can kind of adjust my approach, you know, kind of going into uh, your next band, which obviously, you know, I mean, then you have a band that has your name on it, you know, uh, so to speak, right? So I'm going to, uh, yeah. And, you know, and some people um, misunderstood, okay, the reasoning behind calling it Jack Star's Burning Star, which is almost a little redundant, you know, it's like, all right, this guy must be on a huge ego trip. Okay, he's got his <laughs> name. Jack Stars, you know, kind of like Ingve Malmsteen, uh, Rising Force, you know, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. And it's not, not enough to have your name in it once, you have to have it in it twice, right? So I had it in it twice, which is like totally ridiculous. But there was a reason for it. And now I kind of got used to it. Um, but the reason was, I felt, you know, if I have, if I really brand this as, as my band, I can never ever be fired because, yeah. you know, it's just has to be that way, you know, and 
or and I can't be sued or we can't have a court case where somebody wants you know to the name you know Jack Sarsbury and Star because a judge would throw that out oh, wait a minute okay now who are you again and why should why should your event be called you know so it was kind of for for pragmatical reasons yeah yeah but so that i mean in terms of future iterations and future bands you know i mean that kind of that helps solve those problems you know but um in terms of the, like dynamic uh, tell me kind of how you approach working with uh, other members of the the band post uh, virgin steel well you know i've always felt that everything is a is a team effort you, you're only really as good as your weakest link. So, and I can never understand why some of these bands, you know, they settle, you know, it's like, why would they want a drummer who's not great or a bass player who's not great? You know, why would they want a singer who was not world-class? And uh, so the dynamics, of you know how I you know form a band and how I is I always look for the best possible talent and uh, I always want to make them uh, feel important and we always equally share in the um, you know when we're doing you know gigs and concerts you know so and that's important you know there it, nobody is my backing band at all it's all a very much a um a team effort yeah and you've done different i mean different bands of course outside of burning St uh, star i mean you've done the blues thing too tell me about your approach when with your your blues band blues band that's a different thing that really um is more of a solo thing you know um and and uh again i always try to get the best people for that too uh I love the blues. Uh, I think I'm good at it. Uh, and I think that they both work hand in hand. Uh, a lot of my favorite metal bands, the guitar players, have a uh, have roots in blues. I mean, we were talking about Black Sabbath earlier. They came out and they were called um, the earth blues band or something crazy but it had blues band in it which is hard for most people to you know to fathom yeah picture it, yeah but they were a blues band and uh in fact uh when uh in fact tony iomi actually even joined jeff hotel for a brief amount of time and he's on a uh he's on a dvd that i have called rock and roll circus with you know Mick Jagger and everybody else, you know. But anyway, I bring that up because Chef Rotel were also a blues band. And then they had offshoot bands like Bloodwind Pig that were that were a hardcore blues band. So it's always been kind of a connection. And you know, obviously, you know, Clapton and Hendrix started off playing blues. Uh Cream, they were just blues on steroids, played through Marshalls. Um, Jimi Hendrix was a phenomenal blues player. Yeah. So I think there's, there's a cool connection and um, I like to kind of embrace both uh, types of music. Yeah, and so when you're going to like write uh, ver for your metal band versus versus blues, like what's your, how does your approach differ um, in, oh. in terms of the writing of the music? Well, it's totally different. Um, the blues, uh, you know, it's it's really coming like ninety nine percent from me, you know, the whole thing. I mean, I'll I'll tell the bass player what to play, I'll tell the drummer what to play. You know, I really it's like a vision that I have, and I really want to get my point across. The metal, because I'm I'm playing with equals, I'm playing with guys that are really at the top of their game. I wouldn't dare you know tell our drummer rhino what to play on the drums he's a world-class drummer probably one of yeah. the best i wouldn't tell uh, ned maloney what to play on the bass he's a world-class bass player he's played with uh the singer from rainbow joe and turner 
He's played with the singer from Kicks, uh, Steve Whitman. Uh, Rhino, of course, has played with Man of War. So these guys have been around the block, and I'm not going to say, hey, you know, play this. That would just be egotistical and wrong, and I'm not going to do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, plus, they wouldn't accept it anyway. They wouldn't take it. They'd be like, no, we're good. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. You, um, my understanding is you received a fan letter at one point from Metallica. Tell me about that. No, that it wasn't a fan letter. It was, um, it was, we, we did a festival together. Uh, I was on the bill uh, and um, we had all these tents backstage. It was called the Breaking Sound Festival in 1984. And it was held outside of Paris at Le Bourget. And uh, Ozzy was there, Dio was there, except uh, I think Metallica headlined over us, but I'm not even sure. I mean, it was really, yeah. close. it was really close. It wouldn't be close today. They would be up there, and we would be at the bottom of the bill. But that's fine. And anyway, um, it was the bass player um, passed away. Kurt, Kurt Hammond. Oh no, Kurt uh, passed away. Okay. Cliff Burton. Oh, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Cliff Burton, and uh, so anyway. We we're hanging out. Of, we everybody had a tent. Like you know, there was like a bunch of tents, you know. And uh, Cliff came with Kirk, and um, we were just talking. And uh, and Cliff said, "You know, I really like that song you guys did, Children of the Storm, which is on the first uh, Virgin Steel album." And uh, I just looked at him, and I was I was like really surprised that he liked it. I said, wow, thank you. That's really nice of you to say that, you know, and I just remembered it because it kind of actually surprised me because they were so much more um, hardcore than we were, you know, they were yeah. actually the, the, the kind of like the precursors of thrash and they, they didn't have like a progressive element or a classical element. So I was really shocked. But later on, when they became like really big, probably like, I don't know, literally three, four years later, I mean, they became huge. Yeah. I remember that. And, and sadly, Cliff Burton passed away before they got to, before he got to really enjoy this incredible ride that they've been on for the last 30 years. Uh, but I, it just, I just remembered it because I thought to myself, you know, this, amongst other things, is probably why Metallica became so big because they didn't let themselves get pigeonholed into one sound. Uh, there's a world of difference from their first album to the Black Album. Yeah. You know, and, and it's that same. A uh, world of difference that existed between the Beach Boys when they were singing about surfing, and then like you know seven eight years later, they're coming up with Pet Sounds, you know, which is about psychedelia and you know and and uh, good vibrations, you know. So so they, you know they they grew Metallica, Beach Boys. The Beatles in the short time they were together, I mean, went from, you know, I want to hold your hand to uh, Sergeant Pepper's, you know, day in the life. And, uh, and I just was, I, I was, you know, it kind of was a, a revelation for me because I didn't think that they would like my music. I yeah. thought, I thought, you know, well, these guys are, you know, I honestly, you know, I just thought they were just confined to thrash music, and that was it, and that was all they were going to do. And uh, I was, I was surprised, you know, because our first album had elements of classical and elements of progressive rock and elements of Middle Eastern, all things, by the way, 
that they would be doing three or four years later, uh, like on the Black Album, you know? So it was, uh, it was really cool that they were able to, to grow. Yeah, yeah, that's really awesome. I actually saw Metallica last weekend. Uh, they oh, were wow. here. They're here in town, and they still, you know, forty-one years later, are <laughs> doing it, and uh, and and got it. And incredible stage presence, you know. So well, let me let me make a plug while I'm getting interviewed by a California. The plug is: if any of the guys in Metallica are watching this, next time you do a Garage Days album, you absolutely should do children of the storm because i think you guys could do an incredible job on it and uh, cliff liked it and i think kirk said he liked it as well so it's all good well, that's awesome that would be i mean that would be great to hear and uh, uh what a cool nod that would be as well right so <laughs> yeah plus i could make some money on it too a little bit you know a little bit of money there hey. right, i'm sure so you, you know, you got to pay for the beer, you know. <laughs> of course, you know, of course. Uh, so so let's talk about your new album a bit, right? Souls of the Innocent. Uh, I had a chance to listen to it and, uh, and I dig it. I mean, tell me, tell me about your process of this, right? I mean, I, I, we're in a different time right now and bands are doing things differently in COVID days and to make the albums happen that are re being released now, of course, things are have lightened up but i mean was was there any challenges covid wise in terms of creating this album where were you with uh with making yes that's a good point because actually there were um you know there was a little bit of reluctance um you know we recorded this album really during the height of covid so there was a little bit of reluctance of people in general to just to socialize to get together to be in the same room, to be like breathing the same air, sweating on each other, talking to each other, you know, giving each other a high five, hugging each other. And, uh, and but everybody in our band, um, you know, we all felt, you know what, the show must go on. So quote Freddie Mercury. Yeah. And um, what are we gonna do? You know, are we gonna, totally uh, you know live in fear or are we going to continue with our lives you know and we chose to continue with our lives and get this album done and it wasn't easy because you know we had to not only interact with each other but you know we had to rent equipment we had to do all kinds of things and and uh but we wanted to do it, and uh, I was really happy that everybody was like-minded, and uh, and we got it done. You know, as they say in Florida, you know, because we got we got our share of rednecks here. They say, "Get her done," you know. Yeah. <laughs> Get her done, you know, and they don't. That's how they pronounce it. So what we did is we get it done. <laughs> we did it. You got her done. Yeah, and so you did it in person. You didn't do the whole sending files back and forth or anything no. like that. You got in the no. studio and, and rocked it out. Studio, we did it. The only element that was done outside was our singer, Alex, because Alex. we have a new singer. He's a, he's a great new singer. He's from Italy. His name is Alex Panza. And, but even then, and here's the ironic and funny part, we still had him come over. We flew him here during the height of COVID. He did. And he came and uh, it was great. You know, I put him up in my house and uh, we got together. We actually uh, collaborated and uh, on, on a couple of things. And uh, it was great. He's, he's a great guy. I mean, I'm old enough to be his father. So is Rhino and so is Ned, you know. Uh, and, and, and so there was a certain amount of, you know, respect, you know, that he was giving, giving us kind of as elders, <laughs> as funny as that sounds, you know, and we were trying to basically get him to just loosen up and be, talk to us like he would his 28 year old friends, you know, or 25 year old friends, you know, it's like Alex, 
I know we've been doing albums forever and, and whatever, you know, but we're just regular guys. We're not multimillionaires, you know, we don't have bodyguards around us 24 hours a day. So let's just all loosen up and really get to know each other. Yeah, so how did, how did Alex get selected? Like, how did you bring him in uh, to the band? Well, you know, our uh, previous singer that we had done three albums with, uh, Todd, really was going more and more uh, to, to be more of a solo artist. And also uh, he joined this band, a very established metal band called Riot. And mm -hmm. uh, we knew that we had to find someone that was going to be on the level with Todd. Todd, Todd, you know, had some uh, big shoes to to follow. I mean, he could sing. He could sing well enough to have been on The Voice, you know, which is one yeah. of these shows where, you know, they get like ten thousand applications, you know, and uh, so he made it to the finals, much in the same way that thirty years earlier I made it to the final of the. Um, Mike Varney album, you know, when I sent my my guitar solo, when Mike Varney was in Guitar Player looking for America's best uh, unknown guitar players, you know, for an album yeah. that he was doing. So it's that same concept. And I understood his need to want to be validated because I wanted, I wanted, you know, 30, 40 years earlier, to be validated. I wanted somebody to pat me on the back and say, you know, you're really good. And I'm gonna put you on this album with America's best unknown guitar players. And so I got it. I knew where he was coming from and I think it's great. And, uh, and then the same thing with Riot. Riot was a very established band. They'd been around probably even longer than Iron Maiden. I mean, I think yeah. they were playing uh, Donington, uh, like, I don't know, like in 77. Yeah. I could be wrong, I could be wrong I, but- our, I think it's I, around that time. You know, I had him on, I had one of their guys on recently. Uh, and so I kind of remember it was around that time. Yeah, the fat checkers <laughs> will find out. But, yeah, they're good at it. You know, they're good at that. Uh, so, so anyway, so, so so he was just such bursting with talent that, you know, it was really hard to find someone like Todd. And honestly, we went through so many people. We had ads going in Blabbermouth and um, uh, Brave, Brave Words, uh, Buddy Knuckles from Canada, all these magazines. You know, we didn't hide the fact that we needed a singer. So we were getting all kinds of, you know, all kinds of people that wanted, to, you know, to try out and sending us, you know, their um, their demos and so on. And uh, it was just a very specific thing that we were looking for. And some of these guys were great, but they were great in another way. Yeah. We needed somebody that had a really good range, that had really good um, power. You know, uh, it's singing in a metal band. Re re it's really uh, requires a lot of strength. Oh, you know, yeah. It, I mean. It's coming from the core, you know, and these guys, you know, that, um, that think it's easy. It's not. I mean, you know, I remember, you know, my dad way back. Uh, oh, these guys are nothing. They're all just screaming, you know. There, there's no great voice like Frank Sinatra. There's no great voice like Tony Bennett. And I said, I don't know, Dad. I don't know. And this Robert Plant guy's got a pretty amazing voice. You know, same thing with uh, Freddie Mercury. Oh, and yeah. So I had to sit my father down and say, and my father was really into jazz drummers, you know, like um, Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich and all that. Mm, yeah. And I said, I said, Dad, you know, this drummer in Led Zeppelin is pretty, pretty awesome. And sat him down in front of the stereo. He listened to the whole thing and he goes, he goes, that drummer is amazing. 
And, uh, you know, that was that, you know, so there is an art to metal singing. There's an art to metal drumming, metal bass playing, metal guitar, you know, it's not, it's not some kind of, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, music that is low on the evolutionary totem pole. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so as you're kind of uh, setting on Alex, you know, with knowing he's in, uh, he's in Italy, right? How does that factor in going beyond the, uh, the album that you created and, uh, and kind of looking forward with the, with the future of the band and live shows and, you know, in future albums that you guys wrote? Well, Alex, you know, we've, we've caught, you know, we've been in touch with Alex a lot. Plus he came and we got to meet each other and, and hang out with each other. Uh, I'll tell you a quick aside real quickly is that I actually didn't even know that I had met uh, Alex four years earlier. Really? He actually went to one of our shows and came, waited online to get my autograph and to get Ned's autograph. And there's a picture of it on Facebook of him looking much younger. He looks like he's like 17, but he was uh -huh. actually... He was actually 25 at the time, but I thought he was, guy must be like 17 or 18 years old. You know, how cool is this? He, he likes our music, you know? Uh, anyway, so we had met earlier and um, he was very, he was really very honored to be playing with us. And uh, that made us feel good, you know, because, yeah. you know, sometimes, you know, it's not about, how many albums you've sold or it's a, it's not it's about the it's not how many fans but it's the quality of the fan you yeah. know and uh it's like you know in the 80s and 90s and so on and even you know the last album we did it wasn't it's not it wasn't easy to find burning star albums in the record store you have to dig you have to go through the B section. And then if you don't see it in the B section, then you go to the S section and look for star. If you don't see it there, then you go to the import section. You got to put some work into it. You're not going to walk into the store and see a gigantic cutout of Britney Spears it's, or whoever is big now or Lady Gaga. Uh, yeah. You have to, and by putting in that effort, it makes you appreciate it even more. And um, so, so I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm digressing a little bit, but it makes me actually respect people like Alex even more because here he is just a guy in Italy in Turin, Italy, who has been following my career probably for like at least 15 years. Wow, yeah. You know, the, the Virgin Steel <laughs> stuff, the Burning Star stuff. And, and he's a young guy. I, yeah. mean, I mean, what I consider young, because I'm old, but you know, he's a, he's a young guy, you know, he's like, I think he's just turned 30. Um, yeah. And it's really cool. And, and I'm not going to lie and, and say that that doesn't move me, you know, and, and make me feel proud. Because like I was saying before, it's not how many fans you have, it's the quality of the fan. You know, it's of the fans, you know, and it's how much involved they are in your career and how, and can you count on them to buy your new album, to come and support you, even in a blizzard in Omaha, you know, which, by the way, I've been there and done that as well. And you see, even if there's only 20 people, they'll come. You know, because yeah. it could be like a small little place somewhere, you know. Yeah. And of course, in the in the larger, you know, metropolitan places, you know, then, you know, or in the places like New York and, you know, California and so on, you know, you, sure. or, or Texas, you know, you're going to get a lot of, of metal heads, you know, because the scene is uh, nurtured there more than some little town in Omaha or something, you know. Yeah. So it's the quality. Yeah. It's the quality of the fan that you know and that's that's just a point that i just wanted to get out there you know? of course
course. Uh, so are, are you envisioning a tour? Like, are you planning a tour for? Yes, we, we will be playing because uh, it's what I love to do. You know, I yeah. love I love being on stage. I love interacting uh, with the audience. Uh, I live for it. You know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, actors. You know, you always see them, you know, in interviews and they're always saying how much they love theater. You know, oh, I love theater because we have the live interaction. And I always thought they were full of it, you know, when I would see them on talk shows saying that, you know, oh yeah, sure you do. Uh, you don't <laughs> like making, you know, $10 million a movie. In movie. You know, you, you want to play some theater group. But in actuality, I, I met a couple of famous actors and I, and I believe them, you know, they really, they want, it validates their life to play in front of people and have the people reach out and touch them and maybe even after the show, meet some of them and, you know, talk, sign autographs, whatever. It's an immediate validation, right? Like, I mean, immediate validation right there versus going, I mean, going in the studio is great and making an amazing album, but but it's very intricate. There's no immediate validation, you know, unless you're on socials and you put it out there and then you, you know, then it can be, you know, everything. But And, and for me, you know, music um, has always been about that. Like um, there was a, a Woodstock reunion concert in 2019. Yeah. Uh, there was two of them. There was one in New York and then there was one in North Carolina. The one in North Carolina actually had more of the of the original artists. It had, you know, John Sebastian, Ken Heath, 10 years after, Jefferson Airplane, you know, a lot of people. And um, I got on the bill, even though I had not played there, but I uh -huh. was on the bill because they wanted to, they liked my blues playing and my classic rock playing. And, uh, and that's actually how I met my wife, Linda. She was uh, doing the... Uh, she, she was a publicist uh, and uh, we met in North Carolina. And, uh, but for me, it was just an amazing thing that, that my music in, enabled me to go to North Carolina on a mountain and to meet people that I had grown up idolizing. You know, like the 10 years after, yeah. Can't eat the Jefferson Starship, you know, John Sebastian. I mean, I used to listen to that. Uh, there was a, he did a theme song for a TV show. It was called Welcome Back Carter. Okay, yeah. And, you know, it was like, Welcome Back. And anyway, so he's up there doing that. And I'm thinking, you know, this is so cool. I'm going to go on. I'm going on the next day. But I'm on the same bill with this guy. I'm on the same T-shirt with him. Yeah. With 10 years after, you know, and I was a big Alvin Lee fan uh, from 10 years after, the guitar player. And so it's like how uh, music for me opened up a lot of doors. And no matter really how big it gets or how small it gets or whatever, it can't ever be diminished in my mind because of all the great things that it's done, you know, in my life. Yeah. You know? yeah. That's, I mean, that's incredible. And and so that leads me to kind of, as we're wrapping up, I'm curious, like, I mean, having played music for so many years, what's a what's a fun story you have from a sh playing a show in the Bay Area? Wow, okay. Well, first of all, I've never performed in California. Never. Oh, really? Never. I Got almost did. I almost did. With Virgin Steel, I was in touch with a woman who was a promoter in the 80s. And we were talking about getting the band to go to this place called the Country Club. I don't know. It was a mm -hmm. big place in the 80s. Uh, but that never panned out. The furthest we got was actually um, Chicago, where we were getting, where Burning Star was, was on the radio with, um, they had this thing in the 80s called Satellite Radio. Mm -hmm. Satellite was a big, new thing and we were on Z Rock and uh so we 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 kind of wanted to hit all those places that we were getting airplay and yeah. sadly we weren't getting a whole lot of airplay in California so we ended up you know we went to Texas we went to Chicago we went to all these places 
with where we were getting airplay. But I mean, I love, you know, I love California. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, especially where you're from. Oh, yeah. It's, the Napa Valley, I mean, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's nice out here, you know? <laughs> absolutely, I mean, you know, it's a really uh, beautiful area. I mean, from what I've seen, you know, at least in movies, you know, and, and so on. And uh, I did stay in California, but I didn't have a band. This was before I started really uh, getting active and putting out albums. Yeah. I stayed in uh, Marin County, yeah, it's uh, near uh, San Francisco. My sister was living there, and uh, and it was great. It was uh, it was just exactly the way I pictured it. You know, a yeah. lot of uh, really creative musical people who were living there and making music. You know, kind of like it was the personification of uh, of the Jefferson Starship song. You know, we yeah, built yeah. this city. This city, oh yeah. It's just we another the Sunday. City. They talk. They, they talk about the Bay Bridge and everything, and it's yeah. Just for, it's it's so cool, you know. Well, absolutely, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, so with one more thing with the new album. Um, yeah. I read you're going to be having three music videos for for the album. Yes, and, and I'm really happy about that. Um, uh, our label, our Global Rock, and our manager Giles Lavery really are behind this you know a lot of times you know labels will sign a band because it's like ah oh, i'll sign these guys and they'll do whatever they're going to do but they want more than that yeah yes there's a cult amount of people that are going to buy the album no matter what but they're not satisfied with that and i like that and um giles saw the immediate necessity of uh, making sure that we were represented in the world of video. So we made three videos uh, and they're, they're a little bit of everything. Some of them are conceptual videos. Some of them are total performance videos. And uh, I think it's, um, I think it's, they're really, they're good videos. And uh, we, you know, we're a visual society. We really yeah. are. And, uh, and men especially, you know, and I think, there's probably a preponderance of men that listen to metal, but we're visual. We're visual creatures. You know, we need to see it and we need to uh, kind of embrace the visual aspect of whatever it is. So it's important. In fact, I actually would like to get one more video and make it four, but I'll have to talk to them because I know there isn't an unlimited budget, but but so far they've been really good. And uh, Brian Parker, who's the uh, the president of the label, has really been great. And they're actually gonna release some of the older albums as well. So we're really happy about that because my feeling is none of this music that we've done is perishable. You know, yeah. it's like, there isn't a shelf life. People are buying the first Metallica album, the first Virgin Steel album, uh, the first Burning Star album, they'll, it's none of it is perishable. And I equate them all because they're all good. They're all good yeah. albums and, and they shouldn't be perishable. And on that note, I think it's important that what they're doing also is with releasing the older stuff, I find that to be really, really a great thing, you know, that yeah. all that stuff's going to get available again. Yeah, that's that's really exciting, and I'm I'm sure you're excited for the new album to roll out oh. here next month, and the re hear the reaction from that and everything, which is really cool. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to seeing people's reaction. In fact, the other day I was even thinking that it would be really cool. You know how they have these videos on uh, YouTube where they sit down somebody and they and who might not even be into metal. And they say, hey, what do you think of this music? Give us your impressions. I would like to do that, um, which we'll probably end up doing it. Just take a couple of people off the street, have them listen to them and say, hey, what do you think? Because, you know, I'm going to say one last quick thing. Uh, there was this uh, this female singer. I don't know. I've, I'm not sure her name, 
but she was on the uh, she was on one of those uh, discover singer type shows like uh, American Idol. Okay, sure. And they were like listening to some singer, and she said something like, "Oh wow, this is rock. I didn't know they still had rock." I'm like what uh, a dumbass. Hold on, let me ask my wife, Linda. Who who was that that said that? Who was the idiot woman that said, come over here. You're going to make an appearance in the video. <laughs> Who was the woman that said rock is dead or whatever? Oh, I think it was Kelly Clarkson on The Voice. What, what, what Say hi to Steve Jones. Uh, hi, Steve. Oh, good to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. It was Kelly Clarkson. Kelly Clarkson. Okay. On the, so, voice, the judge on The Voice. The judge on The Voice. So she okay. said, oh, they still have rock. I mean, yes, they still have rock. And guess what? <laughs> They still have metal, and we're yes. doing. It. It's still there, and you're proving it's sticking around. And you know, and got to gonna get out there and play some shows. Keep keep it going, right? So you know, my mom's 105, so I don't know wow. how long I'll live, but I I'd be happy to to live. You know, close to that. I'll take I'll take 90. <laughs> yeah, well, that's I mean, that's the life we're living. She's been able to see the whole thing, you know, for uh, for you. So I'm sure she's proud. She is. She yeah. really is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jack, thank you for taking the time today. I, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, the album's great and look forward to it rolling out and hearing the reaction for from everybody else as well. So. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate yeah. it. And uh, hopefully Absolutely. one day we'll, uh, we'll be out there on the West Coast. I great. hope so. It'd be great to see you live for sure. Because you get you get into it. You're, you're a madman on that guitar, I tell you. So. <laughs> thank you, brother. I appreciate it. <laughs> For sure. You have a great day, okay? All right. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jack. Bye. Bye. That was my interview with Jack Starr of Jack Starr's Burning Star. Uh, and uh, I will preface uh, because I'm really excited about uh, something that we, we always say for the end of the, the podcast historically, uh, and that is Dave Grohl. Uh, there's a Dave Grohl story coming at the end of the uh, program. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, really exciting times. But before we get into that, there's other uh, stories going on. And I think we have to start with uh, some, you know, the elephant in the room, per se, and that is the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Uh, and you're, you may be asking, okay, uh, how does that have to do with, what does that have to do with music or music news or anything along those lines? It's not, it, it, that's not music news. Keep, keep out of my music news. Well, so many musicians have, have pulled together and uh, are, uh, are speaking out about, uh, about the overturn of the, um, uh, the abortion law that has been in place for over 50 years, right? And, uh, and so uh, the first uh, example I'll share with you is Cindy Lauper. Uh, she shared a, a re-recorded version of an abortion rights song called Sally's Pigeons uh, in wake of Roe v. Wade reversal. It was famously inspired by a friend of Lauper's who passed away after a back alley abortion. Uh, and that song is from 1993. Uh, and in a series of tweets that accompany the new, more stripped back and uh, plaintive version of Sally's Pigeons, Lopper wrote, in my childhood, women didn't have reproductive freedom. And 50 years later, we find ourselves in a time warp where one's freedom to control their own body has been stripped away. She continued, when I wrote this song with Mary Ch uh, Chapin Carpenter in 1991, we wrote about two little girls who dreamt of stretching their wings like the pigeons they watched uh, that flew above them. They dreamt of being free, but freedom then for women, uh, uh, and unfortunately now, comes at a big price. If we don't have control over our own bodies, then we have no real freedom. We are second-class citizens. We need to mobilize. We need to let our voices be heard. Uh, so there's a new version online uh, if you want to uh, check out uh, that song. Uh, there's many, many other artists who have uh, who have voiced their uh, opinions as well, including Taylor Swift, Pearl Jam, Charlie XCX, uh, Phoebe Bridgers, uh, so many more. Uh, Janelle Monet at Glastonbury, lots of people at Glastonbury Festival. The ET Awards was riddled with uh, uh, people speaking out, flipping birds, what have you. 
Um, Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day uh, tells the crowd he's renouncing American citizenship following Roe v. Wade uh, reversal. He says there's just too much fucking stupid in the world to go back to that miserable fucking excuse for a country. Uh, and he said that in London, by the way, and that in you know, one of his shows in the country. Uh, it's, he's on the Hella Mega tour uh, right now, and that's when he, when he said that. He said, fuck America. I'm fucking renouncing my citizenship. I'm fucking coming here. Uh, I don't believe it, but you know he's a very frustrated, obviously, by um, by the denouncing of Roe v. Wade. Uh, there's uh, and so he said, "Oh, I'm uh, uh, I'm not kidding. You're going to get a lot of me in the coming days." Uh, and uh, he said, uh, "Let's see here. For the first time in nearly five decades, abortion will no longer be protected as a federal right in the U.S. Each state will be able to decide individually where to restrict or ban abortion." Um, Taylor Swift said, I'm absolutely terrified that this is where we are, uh, that after so many decades of people fighting for women's rights to their own bodies, today's decision has stripped us of that. Um, and uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Billie Eilish addressed uh, this as well, saying today is a really, really dark day for women in the US. And I'm uh, just going to say that because I can't bear to think about it anymore in this moment. Uh, it's it's a challenging time and without going too far down, you know, the, the rabbit hole in a political issue, uh, it's, um, I, I have a hard time understanding the other perspective, uh, you know, the pro-life perspective as they call it, because they are trying, uh, no matter which way you slice it, pro-life people are trying to make a decision for other people um in terms of their bodies a decision that does not directly affect them and it could lead to um other uh political issues and issues that and rights rights that uh that people have including gay marriage and what have you uh that uh it's a slippery slope to renounce roe v wade um and uh and it's it's disappointing that our country you know takes these steps back uh in this way uh it's it's sad for those uh, who will not have a choice in how they need to protect themselves in certain situations, including rape, incest, including uh, medical reasons why uh, they cannot have their, their baby. Uh, I have an old best friend uh, from high school who um, had a, uh, an abortion uh, that I didn't realize um, because I haven't kept up with this person that, that much, but, um, but it was a medically needed decision that she, that she had to make, and she was proud to that she was able to make that decision. It's, 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 it's sad. It's just sad. Um, I'm, and I'm going to leave it at that and move on with the music news. Uh, and because but I'll voice the artists uh, that are are standing up for for this tough time in in history. Okay, um, Ozzy Osbourne has announced a new album with. Uh, new single, Patient Number Nine. He does not slow down. Ozzy has not slowed down it's, or stopped, right? Um, the single also uh, features contributions. I mean, this is a jam-packed single here uh, from Red Hot Chili Peppers' Chad Smith, Metallica's Robert Trio, Zach Wilde, of course, Ozzy's boy, uh, and producer Andrew Watt. Uh, and uh, fe features guitar work from Jeff Beck, as I said. Uh, Let's see, a music video has also been released alongside the single that sees Ozzy portraying a titular patient uh, hunched over in what appears to be a room in a mental asylum before he falls into a comic book-esque world of madness. Uh, uh, lights project bats all over the room as Ozzy's iconic voice sings, when they call your name, better run and hide, tell you you're insane, you believe their lies. Um, and that's... Uh, uh, the album is set to be released on September 3rd, which also includes contributions from Eric Clapton, uh, Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath, uh, Mike McCready from Pearl Jam, Duff McKagan of uh, uh, Guns N' Roses, uh, Chris Cheney from Jane's Addiction, uh, and um, also the late uh, drummer Taylor Hawkins um, on, on that pro uh, project. So, um, and uh, just so in case you're wondering about Ozzy's health condition, uh, he's updated fans uh, as he recovered from a recent major operation, and he said uh, Debbie, that could determine the rest of his life. He told fans in a statement, I'm definitely feeling the love and support from all my fans and send everyone a big thank you for their thoughts, prayers, and well wishes during my recovery. Um, and so he's got a lot going on physically, but he is not slowing it uh, down musically. Um, 
All right. I mentioned Jeff Beck. Uh, well, Jeff Beck and Johnny Depp, uh, recently off of uh, the trial of the, the, the year, um, cover the Beach Boys, Caroline No. Uh, they're set to release a collaborative album next month. Um, and uh, the album is called 18. Uh, the single, which is an instrumental version of the Beach Boys original, was accompanied by a music video of Beck and his band playing the song for an appreciative live audience, though Depp was understandably missing from the music video. Hmm, wonder what he was doing, huh? Um, yeah, so uh, Depp made headlines, of course, on May 29th when he made a surprise appearance at Beck's uh, show in Sheffield. He went on to join back on stage at a handful of other gigs, despite awaiting the verdict in his defamation trial against his ex-wife, Amber Heard, uh, at the time, leading to the announcement of the album at the, uh, the beginning of this one. I love it. I love it. Artists aren't even slowing down. Like, he can't stay off stage. Uh, he loves music, uh, as well as acting, of course, right? Uh, he's, uh, uh, I, I've never gotten a chance to see Johnny Depp perform live, but, uh, but that would be pretty cool. Um, they also released a cover of Velvet Underground's Venus in Furs uh, with the announcement of the album, uh, and uh, they really enjoyed playing together. Uh, all right, let's get to our final. Uh, no, no, there's one more story. Gosh, there's so, I, I told you at the beginning, there's a lot of music news. Uh, one more story before we get to our final story. Uh, Chris Martin from Coldplay took over a family pub's piano to play Coldplay's A, Sty a Sky Full of Stars. Uh, and he was just coming off a string of North American concerts, mostly stadiums, I believe, uh, on their music of the Spears world tour. Uh, he, uh, he was filmed playing the song at the pub, the Stag Inn in uh, Hinton Charter House Bath after a friendly chat with some patrons who seemed to be planning a wedding. Uh, while enjoying a pint at the pub, Martin appeared to have taken patrons request to play the song, smiling as he launched into its opening notes. Uh, you never know who might pop in for a pint. What a lovely man he is, the owners of the pub road in their post on uh, uh, June 26th. Uh, you can see video of that online. Uh, so that is uh, uh, pretty cool. And he's also bringing out some guests along the way on his tour, including Bruce Springsteen, Kylie Minogue, Lupe Fiasco, and Kelly Rowland uh, uh, at various stops. So you can check out Chris Martin and his, uh, his friends. Um, uh, at live shows he's doing. All right, the final show. Yes, uh, I said it before, Dave Grohl. Uh, we used to finish every episode, just about every episode throughout the year with a Dave Grohl story, something cool and amazing he's done. Uh, and uh, for obvious reasons, including Taylor, uh, you know, around Taylor Hawkins, uh, untimely sad death, um, you know, uh, we took a break from ending this uh, the show with Dave Grohl stories. but. We're back and we have an awesome Dave Grohl story. The Foo Fighters are, of course, as well, playing a show in LA in September uh, that is very sold out. I tried getting tickets. Uh, it is uh, with many, many guests. It's a celebration of uh, uh, Taylor Hawkins' life with a lot of his friends and family and, uh, and musicians who respect him. Uh, and it's got a huge killer lineup. Um, I'm not done trying to get tickets to that. I'd love to be there and be able to report back for Concert Pipeline, but we will see how that looks. Um, all right, Dave Grohl. Uh, Dave Grohl joined Paul McCartney for his first public performance since, since Taylor Hawkins' death. Um, Bruce Springsteen also served as a surprise guest during the Glastonbury uh, headlining set. Uh, so uh, this is a continued celebration of Paul McCartney's 80th birthday um, in Somerset, UK, uh, and uh, he brought out Dave Grohl and Bruce Springsteen uh, as guests over the course of a 38 song set. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Um, and uh, so uh, McCartney introduced him as my friend, your hero. Uh, Dave Grohl walked out on stage and he said, hi, Paul, uh, how are you? <laughs> it's a good way to start, right? Um, and then they kicked into the Beatles. I saw her standing there. Grohl took over some of the lead vocals, followed by uh, Wings Band on the Run, which Grohl had previously covered with the Foo Fighters. Uh, and then immediately afterwards, Strings reprises his uh, MetLife Stadium appearance with McCartney on June 16th, again playing his old glory days with McCartney on bass and backing vo vocals. Uh, on the final song, the Beatles, The End, both Grohl and Springsteen came back on stage to take part in, in guitar. And Grohl said, I swear, I would never miss being right here with you right now uh, after explaining that he made it to Glastonbury despite two canceled flights. Uh, he's, he made it there. Uh, 
so uh, there's uh, uh, there's uh, there were other guests along the, the way, but those are the the notable ones. And uh, what an incredible set! And it's great that Dave's you know been able to do what he loves and uh, is healing through his music. Um, all right, that is our show for today. I want to thank Jack Star again. We have a lot of great shows coming up uh, uh, on Concert Pipeline, including an interview with Priest. Uh, we have uh, Frankie Perez coming up on the on the program. We have uh, Heavy Gus, uh, which includes a member of the Lumineers, um, uh, among two other uh, bandmates. Lots more coming. Uh, so stay tuned. Subscribe, like the podcast. Uh, go to us on all, all the socials, all of that fun stuff. Uh, and for all of us here at Concert Pipeline, I'm Steve Jones. We'll catch you next time.